Welcome to The Future is Made with Finland. Before we introduce you to your host for today, here's a short technical orientation. This is an interactive show and we want you to engage from the start to the end. At the bottom of your screen, you will see this function for general conversations with your hosts, the panelists, and one another. Go ahead and say hello there if you haven't done so already. Next, we have the Q&A function. This is where you can ask any specific questions around today's topics and our panel members will respond to those as we go along. If you see a question that you like, you can upvote it and when we get to our panel discussion, those questions will get priority. Also, if you see a question that you know the answer to or have a comment to add, please do so. We may run a poll or two during the show, so please add your vote there as well. If you run into technical difficulties, try to exit Zoom and enter the show once again. And now, without any further delay, here are your hosts, Masia Beje and Albert Daslo. Hello and welcome from wherever you're joining us on the continent and even further. My name is Masia Peche and with me is my fellow co-host Albertus Lowe. Yes, welcome from my side as well. Masia and I are coming to you from the Future Africa campus at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And we are very curious to hear where in the world you are from. Yes, so go ahead and type your city or town and country in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And while you do that, let's give you a little bit of an overview of what the series is all about. In this series of three episodes, we're taking you on an Arctic adventure to discover ways in which Finland and Africa are already working together to create a future of excitement and opportunity. This is episode two, and if you've missed the first one, don't worry. Here is a quick overview of what happened in episode one. In the previous episode, we got a bit of an introduction to Finland, its beauty, amazing quality of life, and its culture of innovation especially when it comes to education, science and technology. We chatted to Peri Soeri, who plays for Finland's national soccer team, about his deep African roots, as well as with Anne Lamila, Finland's ambassador to South Africa. We looked at a few of Finland's world-class universities, as well as the plug-in campus of Turku University at the University of Namibia. We discovered some cool Finnish-African collaborations, including Code School Finland, that teaches kids important futuristic skills through coding and robotics. We heard from some high school kids about their thoughts on studying in Finland, and then met some students from Africa who shared their actual experiences of studying in Finland. We also chatted to some African researchers who are currently working in research in Finland. And we ended off with a lively panel discussion. So today we're stepping in to the lab of the future and zooming in on some research that we touched on in the last episode. 
But before we sink our teeth into the juicy details, we would like to introduce you to your panelists who are standing ready to answer your questions and also share some of their personal experiences. So let's dive right into the fascinating wonder world of science, technology and research that these guys are a part of. Now, Finland is known for its science and innovation and even though they're a small country with a tiny population, it does give them quite an edge in the world. Finland is the greenest country on the planet. As a small Nordic nation, it's always been in our nature to preserve what's valuable. We're incredibly rich in natural resources, but also experts in using them in a sustainable way. Finland is a world leader in circular economy. We have the best experts and innovations for using energy and raw materials in a smart way. The more everything circulates, the less anything goes to waste. We are on a mission to save the world for future generations. The revolution in sustainable textile fibres starts in Finland. Spinova is a company that turns cellulose into textile fibres without harmful chemicals. These fibres can be used to create the most sustainable fabrics in the world. We don't dissolve the cellulose. We use zero harmful chemicals and minimal amount of water. And the only waste stream in the process is steam. Finland plays a big part in solving the global plastic problem. We are experts in creating sustainable alternatives for it. Sulapak is a revolutionary company that creates safe and microplastic-free materials for various applications. The main components of the materials are wood chips and plant-based binders. All the materials biodegrade fully into CO2, water and biomass. Plastic waste is a global challenge. We believe that innovations like our materials are really important in leading the way towards more sustainable use of materials and in general towards more sustainable lifestyles. So, why Finland? Circular economy is a way of rethinking everything, energy, resources and products. It's a way of being ecological and creating value at the same time. Finland is a world leader in circular solutions. We have the resources, the experts and the know-how to create world-changing innovations. Finland works for us, now let it work for you. Business Finland, world ideas. Some of the things they're doing is like watching a futuristic movie, like real science fiction stuff. Yeah, like imagine walking into a lab and literally creating the future of your dreams.
innovation is not only about doing cool things, it's about finding solutions and making a real difference. You could change anything in the world, find a solution to create a better future. What would it be? Wow, that's a serious question. Hmm. Uh, I think um, one thing I keep emphasizing is the implementation of social economic rights. Investments in order to sustain our country, our communities in education, health, safety, every um, individual needs. Yeah, to have a safe country that, um, um, that has, you know, jobs for people, like, um, and, and for, for, for our country to be well off. I think that going the route of um, entrepreneurship, like encouraging the youth and encouraging people to start to develop their businesses, tap into their talents, tap into what they are good at in order for them to actually create jobs for the society. We do have the skills, we do have the resources, but we always opt to outsource instead of upscaling and using what we have in the country. Shape policy on international level, um, in environment and labor and innovation, being there to be recognized as one of the intellectuals who has shaped the idea or collaborated or added the, the, the impactful um, the impactful idea that changes the world. I believe healthcare should be free for everyone, especially people who cannot afford it. I mean, I'm in an engineering environment where males are expected to be uh, the dominant or expected to perform better than women. So I'd like to be an environment that's open-minded, an environment that accepts and gives women the same opportunities as, as they do to, 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 to men. One of the areas that Finland is really excelling in is photonics. For what? Photonics. What's photonics? Uh, photonics is, um, uh, you know, it's... Um... Yeah, don't worry about it. Let's watch the video. At first, there was only darkness. At least during the night. Then, something emerged. A shining beacon that spawned the creativity of mankind. It sparked our quest for knowledge. With science as our tool, we were able to study and mold it into a plethora of forms. It enthralled our minds. It was time to pass the torch. An institution was born. Thriving industries arose from it and spread around the globe and beyond. It was photonics, the science and technology of light. I actually had no idea what photonics was until I met a bunch of guys from Ghana. These guys and girls went to study photonics in Finland and are on a mission to change the economy of Ghana and the rest of the continent through the power of science. Everything started with light. So when we go back to the Big Bang, when there was this explosion, it was an emission of light. Light interaction with matter. The generation the manipulation and the detection of light. We try to generate the light source, we try to manipulate it and we try to detect it. We watch YouTube, we have fast internet because we are connected with fiber optics, which is photonics. If you go to the bank, you swipe your card and there has to be some photons being shot at something and being detected. We have displays, we have phone, mobile phones, we have TVs, augmented reality. The new vehicles that we see, they are all made of LED lights and they look spectacular. We have laser surgery, we have spectrometers, we have endoscopy. Now we are going 3D, we try to uh, project images and stuff, virtual reality. Even this thing I'm wearing is photonics.
Prince is now working on the development of a super drug analyzing machine. Now we have a prototype machine. Yeah, whereby you can just put some tablets inside and then within some seconds, it gives you information about their quality, their release properties. These guys are real pioneers trained at Finnish universities and working on solutions to some of the biggest challenges we face around the world. Benjamin is tackling the scourge of plastic pollution. The water pollution by microplastics. So we try to see the characteristics of these plastics in water, how it is like and how we can detect them even in rivers, in, um, in bottled waters and whatever. Marianne works on the development of nanostructured graphitic films and integrated optics for medical applications, but also to solve one of our biggest challenges in Africa. One of our major problems is power crisis. And we have a lot of sun. <laughs> That's a natural resource we are not making good use of. Even here in Finland, they are using solar panels. Even with the little sun they get, they are using solar panels, and we have all this sun. Another alumni from a Finnish university is using photonics in one of the biggest health challenges in Africa. Some of us are working on instruments whereby we can detect malaria. So you just shine some light on your skin, and then you can detect the, the presence of malaria parasites in your blood. With such a growing group of top photonics experts, they had an idea. So then why don't we place Ghana as the right position so that Ghana will become the gateway for photonics applications in the future? The next big thing as we are seeing now is in the field of photonics. So we want the kids or we want Africa to be prepared in general, to be prepared for this opportunity. Like looking at London, London is already an old city and then you cannot start London again. You get it, yeah. But Africa, we are yet to develop. So we can now put in place all these smart city ideas. The end goal is to have an institution that we can tackle some main challenges in Africa. Normally when Africans, we come here to study, we see the environment. We look at how things are working and then we can easily identify problems in our, our countries. And normally the best step is to, to take an action. So we are not just identifying the problems and then blaming the leaders or blaming politicians, no. But then we need people, so we try to uh, not start from the top, but from the bottom. And one of the ways they're doing it is with the help of their Finnish and other partners to provide university and high school students in Ghana with photonics kits that they can use to discover some of the fascinating secrets of the science. We are telling the young generations that, okay, do science. Venture into science. With science, we can solve our problems. I really would like to come back to Ghana, teach and also motivate another girl sitting somewhere and saying, oh my God, science is so difficult. I cannot do this. Seeing me, me, this small girl, <laughs> she might be uh, encouraged to do it. Uh, I see that Africa is capable of solving her own problems. My hope and dream for Africa is complete liberation, where we can take decisions on our own, financially support these decisions and have the manpower, which is now mostly in the Western world. Africa is our own. Nobody will do it for us. I, I mean, nobody. If you are able to carry your own burden, I'm able to carry my own burden, then whoever is leading us has a less work to do. So we should focus on developing ourselves, individual ourselves first. And the, the rest will be, I mean, it will be solved by itself. We are capable of solving the problem of Africa and we can do it because we have the potential, we have everything. It is just believing in ourselves. I just love them and it's so cool to see what can be born from collaboration. The fact is when we bring our strengths together, we can really be powerful in what we create. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Creating together is what Future Africa is all about. You can even see it in the architecture and design. 
The timber used is actually sustainably harvested wood from Finland. And there's a big emphasis here on creating together. When I started to live here, I wasn't really aware that we would be living with other residents from all over Africa. Sometimes in, in doing things in isolation, you may encounter challenges that you think you are, they are peculiar to your circumstance. But in bringing uh, perspectives from different places, it helps you see, uh, it gives you a fresher eye and helps you even um, get a better idea of how to handle um, the issues. Um, I cannot uh, venture in all those research fields but we can work together hand in hand with people from different countries and different research background. That is what uh, Future Africa and the FABI, they are known for. It was like interdisciplinary, like you could just imagine that now we get to interact with different people from different cultures who have different experience in the research from those different countries. In my opinion, every study should be interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary with what we have currently, because no single field can exist on its own, no single country can exist on its own. So incorporating all of that different knowledge could make the research even better and it also involves different um, techniques and different ways of doing things. When it came to COVID-19, the, the, the countries, the researchers in different countries were collaborating. They were giving out all their finding out for everyone to use, such that they don't spend more resources on doing the same thing which has already been discovered elsewhere. So that is why you see the need for collaboration. Imagine if you were to spend 10 hours doing something, but because now I have a Finnish friend and we come together and they have a way of doing the same thing in five minutes. And it saves me a lot of time because I have been able to leverage the technology that they have to do something that ordinarily would take me a longer time. We, we want to get those synergies, even for us people in the South. We want to work hand in hand to solve world problems. And they also get to uh, get exposed to what are the different problems that we encounter here in South Africa as compared to them and how can they actually contribute to bringing solutions to the problems that we encounter here and what can they actually gain? What knowledge can they gain and take back home? It's like a win-win situation. You're getting your gain, I'm getting my gain. So we're both winning while doing something faster and also building relationships that uh, would um, in the long run maybe lead to even greater impact. And there are quite a few good examples of Finnish-African collaboration. As humans, we all have similar needs, whether we're in tropical Africa or in the Arctic. So taking hands to find solutions together just makes sense. We all have social issues. We all want to create a better future. And obviously, education is key in all of this. One of the areas that Finland just happens to be world renowned for. Finland today has one of the highest standards of living in the world. But few people realize that they used to be a poor, oppressed nation that used education as the key to turn their fortunes around. We chatted to professors from the University of Helsinki, the University of Johannesburg, as well as the Pedagogical University in Mozambique about some Finnish-African collaborations in education. Finland, I think, is a, is a living example of an education system that's transformed itself over a 20 to 30 year period uh, into one of the best in the world. Finland is a reference in education uh, in almost all subjects, even African languages, even the use of, uh, of minority languages in education. And they have a long history of collaborating with Southern Africa. They collaborated with Fred Limu, they've been with us since the beginning, since the independence. Finnish people have also suffered oppression and hardship. That really helps them to understand hardship and suffering in Africa. They were pioneers, for example, in uh, introducing projects aimed at uh, promoting inclusive education. 
Finland's reputation as pioneers comes from their strong emphasis on research to stay on the cutting edge. All learning scientists know that we have global crisis in learning. It goes also here in, in, in European countries and, and in the United States. And if we are able to find the ways to support children to learn in Finland and in South Africa, which is very different learning context in some sense, uh, then we have probably also potential benefit for, for global problems. One of the problems they identified was with children that struggle with mathematics. And our goal was to narrow the gap, what the low performers had when they start to, to go to school. And we did an, an eight weeks intervention program based on research on basic skills of early numeracy and we have tested it in Finland. Because the University of Helsinki have been doing joint research with the University of Johannesburg, they decided to test their intervention program in South Africa. And it showed like that after intervention, the kids who participated had better performance level. And what is the highlight of my career is that it is sustainable. They don't fall down even though we stop teaching. They taught them twice a week, uh, 45 minutes, for eight weeks. So it's quite small amount of, of extra teaching what was needed to get the real results go higher. Dr. Hendriksen's Pedagogical University in Mozambique and the Uvascular University of Applied Sciences in Finland are collaborating around teacher training with a project they call Tepate. And I believe that within this theory practice um, balance in teacher education, that the Tepata project, we are going to be able to help our teachers to rethink their teaching and to dare to learn, be there. In South Africa, the University of Johannesburg and the Finnish University of Helsinki are collaborating in teacher education research. We're preparing young people for a world that we can only imagine. So we have to draw on each other's strengths in order to be able to prepare people optimally to work in this world. And therefore, they wanted to work with the best in the world. Our faculty is very research-oriented faculties and, and almost all the staff members are having PhD and they are research-active people. And in international comparisons, so our faculty has typically been in the best many universities in, in the whole world. So the research in educational sciences is important at our university. A big part of teacher education research is to, to optimize student-teacher learning. How can we make the best teachers possible given the resources we have in the country? One of the models that Finland is using very effectively to train teachers is a model of teaching schools schools that are on campus where teachers can gain practical experience. So in Finland there is a long tradition that we have had a university affiliated schools which are actually they're part of the university. They are just ordinary schools but the staff members are members of the faculty and this means that they have a very heavy orientation to the educational research. The University of Helsinki has worked with the University of Johannesburg to establish such a teacher training school on their Soweto campus. In, in order to understand human learning and engagement, you, you need variation. And, and that's, that's important in educational science. And of course, this variation helps us to understand our own system better. <laughs> if we are just here, <laughs> In, in our context, we, we never recognize what's working and what's not working. They're such well-published researchers, and yet they, they're so willing to invest time and energy in training young people. This 10-year experience until now, it has proved me that this is a very fruitful, productive collaboration. So the collaboration means that we are investing mental resources and time for collaboration and then the outcome is more than we are able to do ourselves. My dream is that when the next pandemic hits, we are much, much better prepared to support learners in different parts of the world. I, I think that this 
collaboration with uh, with African nations will will give us better viewpoints to what is then needed than if we do it only with European like perspective. Uh, it's too narrow. The, the the problems are much more complicated than that. It's about uh, doing the best for the world. The world belongs to all of us somehow. And then if we, this type of collaborations helps, um, helps us develop the skills in order to, to make the world a better place. We learn from them, they probably learn from us, and uh, maybe work at the same level and produce the same results as the Finnish have been able to do. They're not mineral rich, but they've, they've, they've worked um, to, to bring about change through education in society. And that would encourage um, other people to embark in this, in similar kinds of projects, because at the end of the day, everyone has to gain. And then the world becomes a much more interesting place, much more colorful, et cetera, et cetera. Don't you think so? Obviously food is one of the basic needs that we all have as humans everywhere. And we are all dependent on our natural resources to build a better future. So let's take a look at some of the collaborations happening between Finland and Africa in these areas. In finding solutions to some of the challenges we face, we often create unintended new issues. As we move away from fossil fuels and relying more on sustainable resources like forestry, the way we manage these resources becomes critical. When this uh, need for the natural resources is increased, it also creates the pressure not only towards natural resources, but also towards those people who live in those areas where these resources are coming. And therefore it makes sense that countries work together to find solutions to these global issues we all face. In Tanzania, the government encouraged people to plant trees in response to climate change. These were mainly small plantations owned by individuals, and some complex issues arose. Now they don't have enough land to do agricultural um, activities, so that was the immediate problem. Um, the second problem that developed afterwards was that um, the middlemen made more money than the smallholders themselves. At the same time, forest fires kept breaking out on a regular basis. It soon became apparent that it was done deliberately because of conflict between the different stakeholders. The indigenous sell land at a very low price only to realize that the, the value of land is higher than they thought before. And when that happens now, they, they demand back their, their land by force. And they do that by, uh, by touching the trees. Some of the owners live in urban areas and were directly affected by the pandemic. Translocal farmers, farmers who are staying in the city, and then they're involved with the tree uh, farming as a business. So it was difficult for them to move around since there are a lot of restrictions last year. So at times, some people don't send money on time when maybe the laborers have worked in their farms. So that also it causes problems and among others it goes back again to fire when they see they have worked the payments are not sent on time. They can just retaliate by burning down the trees. In response to this, the College of Business Education in Dar es Salaam, the University of Eastern Finland and African Forestry brought their unique strengths together in a project called Makutano. Makutano in Kiswahili means gathering. So Makutano is there to look for the ways in which these different actors can come together and collaboratively address some of the challenges which they are facing. Uh, the role that African forestry has given us is to be able to act like a convener or bring in different actors together. My role was to, uh, to see how we can facilitate those workshop, workshops collaboratively. Our role is external. Uh, external actors as so researchers now have been rather so training, uh, training these conveners and, and facilitators in Tanzania. The history of, of, of the country is more of a top-down approach when it comes to governance. And most people believe that uh, 
if the higher ups know more than everyone else. If these actors come together and work collaboratively, they can come up with a more um, sustainable solution than using these government procedures, which in most cases are top down. This year we went back to the Southern Highlands and we conducted a workshop. So with that workshop, mainly it was more participants led workshop. We tried to use different approaches like empathy mapping and World Cafe methods to, for instance, uh, discuss the, the main causes of fire, the issues, people to share experiences. And at the end of the day, farmers were able to discuss challenges, why first the, the fire come, is coming in place and what can they do to resolve those issues. In the workshop, everybody saw that there's an opportunity that, that can be done or there's a way that can be done that is different from what we're doing and it will actually help. They identify the problem themselves. They identify the uh, actions that needs to be taken. They identify the available resources that are available. And they're also key actors or stakeholders who can help to resolve the, the issue. Our colleagues in Tanzania, the, there is now the growing, uh, growing group of the young researchers, young, young scholars who are now, uh, they have studied in the various different universities. They are also collaborating very internationally. I think it's it's a win-win situation where we are able to borrow experiences and, and expertise on the project that we are carrying on. From the Finnish side, it's, it's important to realize that when they come in, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. Because if I've, I've been um, organizing workshops for the past six to seven years, but then the workshop that we had um, recently was something new, what the approach was different. It's a very dedicated team to, to ensure that they we, we get the results. Uh, we get the results and also we create an impact in the communities we are working with. Food security remains a big challenge in sub-Saharan Africa. With all the uncertainties, including climate change, we need to find smart ways to improve our own ability to grow food. As part of the solution, some Finnish and African universities are working together to develop better ways of teaching agriculture at university level. We are having uh, two projects uh, together with the only public uh, universities in Zambia engaged to agriculture or bioeconomy sector, uh, namely University of Zambia and Mulungusi University. The main thrust in both of these projects is to produce uh, graduates with the uh, 21st century skills. Uh, so we're talking about graduates who will be able to become entrepreneurs and create jobs rather than seek for jobs. The idea is to collaboratively co-create a change in agricultural education in sub-Saharan Africa. Similar to the design-based project learning used by Code School Finland, these two projects use problem-based learning. Traditionally, education, not only in Africa, but, but also in many other countries, uh, the education has started very much from the teacher. So teacher is the one uh, imparting or, or sharing the knowledge uh, she or he has. Problem-based learning is a pedagogical approach to teaching and learning. Um, very, very new to us and very exciting. And in this approach, the student is actually in the center of the learning process. So we have to change the roles completely. Uh, that to take the teacher out of the limelight of the lecture theater uh, and, and let the students be the performers and, and, and move the, the teacher to the background to be still in the lead of the learning process, but uh, being the one guiding students to allow them to find their strengths and, and develop their own knowledge, their own skills and their own right attitude to the world. I think it's an approach that uh, allows students to become innovative to become creative. It's a fantastic approach. And I'm saying to myself, wow, if we had um, started using this support several years ago, I'm sure Zambia would be different from what it is today. <laughs> Education shouldn't be in isolation. Education is to have a living relationship with the industry and societal actors. Our students, uh, uh, are not ready, you know, when they finish, 
uh, school and then they go into industry, uh, they find that there is uh, quite a big gap between what uh, they know, uh, you know, their skill and the skill that is required by industry. So problem-based learning means basically that uh, industry in a way offers small cases which, which uh, the students together with the teaching staff start solving. So uh, producing solutions, ideas, uh, new opportunities for the business, but at the same time having this kind of authentic learning environment where you work with those who will be your future employers. There will be co-creation and innovation processes for the companies. Uh, and also they'll be developing and testing of new products for, com I mean for companies as well as creating new innovation ecosystems. Your attitude part of the competence that you are a good team player, you are a problem solver, you are a critical thinker, uh, you, you can take the courage and guts to start tackling with new issues and the leadership skills. We have, uh, you know, graduates equipped with 21st century skills and uh, who will be able to work for both Finnish and the Zambian companies. Africa will decide very much the future of the globe. What happens in the Africa because of the population growth and what happens in Africa because of the climate change. The cultures are different. Our economies are different levels. The natural resources that we have are different. So literally everything is, is, is different. So just these differences make collaboration extremely exciting. As equal partners, learning from each other and recognizing this need of, of solving the issues, the global sustainability issues together. My dream for the North-South partnership is to transform the young population in the Southern partner countries into vibrant dreamers. Yeah, young people who can dream big, skilled young people who can create employment, not the job seekers, who are self-starters. So developing this understanding that together Finland, northern, northern countries and African countries, including Zambia, that will make the future together. This is the reason we are uh, actively looking for partnerships. Without a healthy environment, we simply can't survive. We can't get the ecosystem services necessary to grow our food and get the raw materials that we need. Some African countries have become world leaders in actually banning single-use plastics and ridding the environment of these pollutants. And in Finland, they have had some amazing breakthroughs to develop really cool alternatives. Let's have a look. Especially in the fashion industry, where researchers from Finnish universities and research institutions have been working with companies to develop eco-friendly alternatives. Imagine how many people there are on Earth. 7.6 billion of us living, eating food and buying a lot of clothes. When I'm grown up, there will be almost 10 billion people on Earth. My dad says we will need a lot of farmland for feeding all those people, instead of farming fibre for clothes like cotton. Mum says there are man-made fibres, but those factories are quite polluting. And in those fibres there's plastic that might end up inside fishes that we eat. Sounds like a problem for the future to me. It is. As we approach 2020, we find ourselves in a situation where the global population's demand for cellulose-based textile fibres, mainly cotton, can no longer be fulfilled with the current production capacity. Also, cotton farming needs a lot of water, land and pesticides. What we need is energy and water-efficient, non-toxic textile fibres to fight challenges like climate change and marine resource contamination, problems made worse by the production and consumption of mainly oil-based synthetic fibres. So how do we sustainably clothe the growing global population? Sometimes it can be hard to see the forest for the trees. However, what has been even harder until now is seeing and utilizing the trees for their fibers. Fibers that can be used to provide sustainable textiles for the growing global population. Spinova's patented spinning technology takes microfibrillated cellulose from sustainable wood as raw material and spins it into a fiber ready to be used in virtually any type of textile. 
The closed process includes zero harmful chemicals, causes zero waste, and its only side product is water, which can be used in the spinning process. This innovation directly addresses five of the United Nations' 17 sustainability goals for 2030. With zero waste and minimal environmental footprint, our production process is at the forefront of sustainable industrialization. Spun out of FSC certified wood pulp and fully recyclable, the spinover fiber promotes sustainable consumption and production for future generations. Cellulose-based textiles help fight climate change by mitigating the global textile industry's impact on global warming. In addition to climate change, synthetic fibers cause stress on the world's sea life population. Our fully organic fiber helps mitigate the ocean microplastics problem and conserve marine wildlife. To promote sustainable forest management and combat desertification, land degradation and loss of biodiversity caused by unsustainable forest management, spinover fiber is only made of cellulose that comes from FSC certified wood. Big challenges call for big innovations. Spinover. Now we've seen some of the projects around food and agriculture, but this next story is truly like science fiction. Imagine you could create food like magic, literally from thin air. This magical science was developed by Finland Sulut or Lapien Ranta Lahti University of Technology and VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. As protein has become an urgent issue from a sustainability point of view, new protein sources are simultaneously becoming more important. At Solar Foods, we are bringing a truly sustainable protein to the market that is completely free from the environmental burdens of agriculture. The next big thing within protein production is definitely cellular farming, which is also referred to as cellular agriculture. It relies on cultivation of cells under controlled conditions for the industrial production of food instead of relying on conventional agriculture or animal husbandry. It can be growing tissue cells and producing meat without the cow, or harnessing, for example, yeast cells and making eggs without chickens, or growing single cell organisms and producing high protein food ingredients, which is what we are currently working on at Solar Foods. Solane is a single cell protein. The uniqueness of those cells is that they are grown on air and electricity as the main feedstocks. What we have in the end is a yellow powder rich in protein and ready to be formulated into food products. My work focuses on the development part of Solene as a food ingredient and understanding its technological and nutritional properties. When working with a completely new kind of food ingredient, the most important thing first is to ensure safety, followed by nutritional value and the other functional food properties. Proteins are essential macromolecules for our body. They are the building blocks of our muscles. But proteins also play a significant role in food formulations. They are structural building blocks of certain food products, such as cheese, a dairy yogurt, white bread, plant-based meat alternatives, and many other food products are stabilized by proteins. If you look at the products from bakery, dairy, ready-to-eat meals, even the dried soups, they all contain protein. It is a fact that conventional food production, which heavily relies on agriculture and industrial animal farming, constitutes a major threat to environmental stability. Fortunately, technological innovations, one being Solane, have made it possible to utilize the diversity of nature and produce an infinite and nutritious food supply, 
In our opinion, Solein and uh, other cellular agriculture concepts offer humanity the prospect of being able to practice agriculture sustainably for many more generations to come. That was magical. Can you just imagine where this research could lead to? Yeah, let us know in the comments. That was mind-blowing. Maybe time to have a look at another Finnish university. Good idea. In Central Campus, we're literally in the middle of the city. And here we have this cool modern library. And at the Central Campus, you can study social sciences, communications, politics, languages, and so on. And close by, you'll find these places. What's your favorite place in this campus? It might be this Pride Cafe just here. It's a good choice. And of course, there's a lot more. See you in Tampa. See you. I'm sure you have lots of questions about studying in Finland, so please type them in the Q&A section. And in our next episode, we'll actually discuss some practicalities on how you can get to Finland to do your studies and research. But now it's time for our panel discussion. So before we do that, just a quick reminder again of who the people are on our panel. Well, welcome back. I'm going to admit this is probably going to be my favorite episode. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I am geeking out a little bit here. Yeah. And for the next half an hour, we're going to delve into your questions. And after that, uh, during the last 10 minutes, we'll introduce you to Finland's representatives in Namibia and Angola before letting you know what you can expect in next week's episode. Uh, we already have tons of questions. You can keep them coming through in the Q&A section. Please prefer that you put your questions in the Q&A sections as opposed to in the chat. Um, and we've got a lot of questions that are very specific to fields of studies where our embassy staff have been trying to share links and answers. And you can find more information about that on the website futurewithfinland.com. That's exactly where you registered for the series. And uh, we'll also post some links and frequently asked questions as soon as the series or this episode is done, um, as well as upload all of the episodes on futurewithfinland.com. So keep sending your questions in, put them in the Q&A section, and we will get to them as we go through the panel discussion. And you can address them directly to one of our panelists or uh, to the panel in general. Thank you, Masia, um, and thank you for our, for our panelists who are joining us. Uh, I see that everybody's videos are live. Um, just an apology uh, from Ngoni. Um, he was a panelist last week, and by popular demand, we asked him to join us again today. But unfortunately, um, he fell ill uh, and at the last minute had to pull out. So we are wishing him um, all the best to recover well. Um, but on our panel, we have uh, Prince, who is a postdoctoral researcher from Ghana, um, who studied photonics in Finland. He is uh, currently at the University of Cambridge doing um, research there. So if you have specific questions to Prince, you can direct it directly to him. Uh, we also have three professors from Finland. Um, the one is uh, Irmeli that you saw in the Makutano project. Um, working with Tanzania, uh, specifically around natural resource management. 
Um, then we then we have Aya, um, who is uh, working with the PBL um, Bio Africa project, especially with Zambia and Kenya, um, which is uh, basically agricultural training. Um, we also have Pirio, who is with the University of Helsinki and focusing on um, education, specifically um, special needs education and mathematics um, and early numeracy. Um, then we have two professors from Southern Africa. Um, we have Nadine from uh, University of Johannesburg who co uh, collaborates with um, Finland around teacher education and also Sarita who is from Maputo. Um, and uh, she is uh, also working in, in um, education and, and training, training of teachers. So those are the specific panelists. If you have specific questions to ask any one of them, please uh, shoot, um, add them to the Q&A box, uh, or if you want to address it to the whole panel, you are welcome to do that. Yeah, I'm going to dive in with um, my first question, and I'm going to direct this one to Dr. Prince, because it's, it's one that I've had particular interest in myself personally. So algorithmic biases, right? And AI biases tend to reflect um, the biases of society. And I think it's really important to somehow figure out a way to say, look, it's important to have a more diverse group of people around development tables. Now, how do we encourage more Africans to understand that to a degree, in order for AI biases and, and algorithmic biases and things like this to reflect a more diverse society, we play a part in how technology works for or against us through education and research. How do we then convince Africans, Dr. Prince, that this is an important thing that we need to do as Africans as much as anyone else in the world? Yeah, so if uh, I got your question, so it's about AI and other technological devices. Yeah, so I think as Africans, Already, we are contributing a lot to any form of technology. And then, um, but the whole idea is to come together and realize that Africa is the best place now to execute these technologies and ideas. Yeah, so what I would say is that practically, Africans all over the world, the globe, contributing one way or the other. I think we should start coming together as we've done with Photonics Ghana. So we realized that in the area of photonics, we think that, okay, in Ghana, so and so people are now experts. So why don't we come together and, and contribute our little quota, develop this technology? in Ghana. So I think when you go to the other aspect like AI, uh, recently we had um, uh, a symposium, Africans in STEM symposium. This was also something we introduced about three years ago in Cambridge. And you see Africans contributing to all fields of technology, space, volcanic eruptions, vaccine development, AstraZeneca vaccine, you see Africans there. So I think the the practical aspect is just have that thinking in our mind that, okay, let's come together. Let's all contribute the little we have to help Africa. And I think this is the way to go. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prince. Um, my next question, uh, I think I want to kind of throw it out to the, to the whole panel. Um, and see who would like to respond to that. Um, I also want to encourage the panelists, if you want to add something to, to what somebody has said, um, please just put up your hand uh, and we will give you the stage to go ahead. Um, we want to keep this informal and uh, yeah. So if anybody wants to add to what Prince has said there, please feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, in the meantime, um, my question is, so I'm a young person from Africa. I'm thinking about my career. Uh, I'm considering studies, um, but with the future being so uncertain, um, we, have, we have this whole thing about AI that are, that are taking over jobs. Um, we have, we've seen this new um, uh, research coming out on climate change, et cetera. How do I 
prepare myself um, best as a young person with such a uh, uncertain future ahead of us? How do I best prepare myself um, for my career? Um, and uh, maybe, Aya, would it be unfair to throw that to you to start with and then maybe some of the others um, come in as well? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Alberto. It's, it's not unfair to start from me. It comes to, it comes to education. This is definitely a question that a lot of young people are thinking when, when they select the careers, but how I would advise you or any, anyone doing the, the, the real choice of life, first go with what your heart tells you. So select a topic that, that you find interest in, that it's, it's close to you, dear to you, because that's the only sustainable. But after that, I would kind of encourage to think that what is really needed from a, from a professional. And it goes to the concept of um, competence that a young professional has to be equip, equipped with a, with a uh, knowledge, the theory, understanding the, the discipline or the subject you are engaged with. You need to have the skills, but then um, the very critical part also is your attitude. Uh, this kind of the, the professional you. And, and this goes to issues like, like critical thinking, uh, lifelong learning, attitude of, of lifelong learning, um, entrepreneurship, uh, teamwork. This kind of skills that make you a good player uh, to be a problem solver together with the others. So I think this is one of the maybe safest ways to become uh, uh, a team player, a good, good professional to work with the others. So there is now Irmeli willing to continue. Thank you very much, Irmeli. Uh, Irmeli, I think you are still muted. Let's see. Ooh, we can't hear you. Um, Irmeli, while you're trying to sort out the sound there, um, Sarita, do you yes. want to quickly come in? Yeah, I think that it should be working. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, that it was very well put by, by Aya that something what you are interested in, something what you are committed with. Uh, it's exactly once we are screening these applications in our, our PhD, for example, applications, uh, it's very easy to see that if the students are committed, are they, are they actually, have they done the uh, homeworks, for example, that uh, they already know that what are the international networks, uh, what are the networks in Finland, but also their home countries which they would like to be part of it, what they would like to study and, and also the career-wise, what they are supporting with their studies. Uh, because if you haven't done this type of homework to find it out, who are your networks in your home countries, but also internationally, I don't think that uh, many of the universities accept these proposals because most likely uh, then you are not able to carry out uh, your PhDs, for example. Because it's uh, whenever you do the research, even if you do it in, in uh, European universities, you need to still have a, a strong connections to your own country. It's a security issue, it's an ethical issue, but it's also you need the research permits in your own countries. So do the networking in your home country and then start to do the networking in, in the country where you would like to do your, your studies. Great, thank you so much, Irmeli, uh, Sarita, and then uh, Pirjo. Thank you, Albertus. I think that uh, in order to respond to this question about uh, how can we prepare ourselves to this rapidly and increasingly changing world, I think that uh, I would agree, first of all, with Aya. You have to choose an area that's really close to your heart, something that motivates you, that fascinates you. But it's not all about that, choosing an area that's going to give you a job, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also, and very important, so about lifelong learning. 
we get trained to get the high education, a diploma, et cetera, but we shouldn't just accommodate. Alberto, as you mentioned, uh, the, all the changes that are brought about by artificial intelligence. Just to give you an example, in the area of translation, there was a time that as a translator, you would just sit down and type and translate uh, from English into Portuguese or any other language. But those days are far gone. Artificial intelligence is taking over in such a way that most of the translation work that's done now became uh, is done by uh, automatic programs and your role as a translator, for example, becomes the role of an editor, a reviser. But more than that, so lifelong learning is, is paramount, but it's about being prepared to innovate, to learn increasingly more. You cannot just stay in one area, adapt yourself because uh, the changes uh, are, are taking place really fast. And this is my answer to the question that was raised. That was raised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarita Pirio. Thank you. I actually <laughs> want just to emphasize what the other ones were saying. That the um, and this is what we say also for the Finnish PhD and new students. So follow your interest. Follow what what you want to do in your life. But then also be equipped with good skills and. Uh, and that's also highly important. Like, of course, I'm come from very quantitative side of the research, so I like statistical skills and that kind of possibilities of, of problem solving. Those are needed when you are in university career, of course. But I would like to emphasize the fact that if I now think that I would be in one of the African countries and thinking what I would do in future, um, I would kind of try to, to identify the key persons in my, my, my area, the one that I want to go to into in the local university. So I would contact first the local universities and the research groups inside there. And then via them to start collaboration with the Finnish university. I think that's the most efficient way and most productive way of, of kind of be part of this kind of fast uh, advancing research, what is going on. So, so kind of try to get in the research groups and that, that's it's much easier from that way. Nadine, I'm gonna ask you this question. If I'm at an African university at the moment, South African university, why should I be considering a collaboration with a Finnish university, for example? Thanks for that question. I think that um, when we stay insular and we stay in our own worlds um, and we only look at research that impacts um, our local context, we forget how much it can be enriched by reaching out to others who've done similar work to ours in a different context. What can it, how can it extend the work we're doing? How can it extend the learning that we have? Um, certainly from our perspective in a Johannesburg University, experimenting with a similar program uh, that has been running and as well established in Finland, we've been able to learn quite a bit from them. But in turn, collaboration is a two-way street. So in turn, our Finnish colleagues will tell you what they too have learned from us. So I think it's about extending knowledge, uh, trying new ideas together, uh, that are fitting for different contexts and not only staying in your own little world. Thanks. Put my mic on there. Thank you so much, Nadine. Uh, Prince, I saw your hand was up. You wanted to answer, I think, was it the previous question or in connection with um, university and collaboration? Yeah, so I'll just start from the previous question a bit on that. Yeah, so I would say that as our honorable panelists have all mentioned, I think it is about interest. And I think uh, one of the things I have been worrying about, about the way we study in Africa is about chasing courses or program that we think are lucrative. So we choose courses based on the, the money. Yeah. But I think this is, when we do that, without the interest, definitely, 
we are going to get stuck along the line. But with the interest, then there's no need to worry. Because if you have interest, you can create an opportunity, new area, money at any time. So I think Africans should be trained to look for their interest, but not to chase the money. And also with the, um, the collaboration aspect, I think um, there are a lot of funds also around, but normally yeah, it's, you are probably to get fund right, when you go into collaboration with especially European investors or Western investors. And I think there are a lot of funds meant for Africa, but in order to assess these funds, sometimes you need to collaborate. And also what I've realized is that when you consider Europe, they have the system, they have the equipment, they have the lab, but the people, and now Africa, the youth are more eager to do more science. So you could see that when it comes to the core science, you may see Africans and Asians dominating. And, and these universities need people to work, to use their instrument. Also in terms of areas which are not yet exploited. For example, Africa, we have a lot of fields or areas yet to be known. So Africa also, we have the data and Europe, they have the, the, the instruments. So I think by collaborating, then we can combine the data, the instrument, the people, and then together we develop the planet. Together we make the, the earth a good or better place for mankind. So I think collaboration is well or very important. And I think we are already doing that with the Invest of Eastern Finland, whereby Photonics Ghana, we are already collaborating and then uh, assessing some funds and then buying some simple instrument to make the teaching of science more practicable in Africa or in Ghana. Yeah, so I think collaboration is the best way to go now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prince. Um, there was a good question asked by Kelly Brito. Um, and I would maybe, Sarita, if you can listen to this one um, and give your, give your thoughts and then maybe one of the Finnish uh, professors as well, if you can raise your hand after you've heard the question. So Kelly Brito asked, uh, how do we avoid asymmetric power relations between global science partnerships? What are you doing to avoid um, this in practice? This is a very good question, no doubt. And um, having collaborated with Finnish un universities, um, what I would say is that this, this kind of partnerships, this kind of collaborations about uh, mutual, bringing mutual benefits, it's about uh, working in a, in a platform where partners from the North and from the South are at the same level. Um, a while ago, Nadine said, uh, said something about that we shouldn't be insular, we shouldn't just isolate ourselves in our own little islands. Those collab collaborations have to be seen as something that, um, as an end result, will bring a win-win situation. Uh, I am uh, um, currently the coordinator, the counter coordinator of the TEPAT project, which is theory, practice, balance in teacher education. This is a project that involves two universities from the north, from Finland, which is the University of Lapland and the University of Yang, the uh, Vascula University of Applied Science, and two uh, universities in Mozambique. Although the funds are, the, are from the Finnish, Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, what we try to bring to the table are skills, skills that exist on our side because our key staff, our Mozambican staff know the reality much better than the Finnish counterpart. And at all times, always, we try to see uh, make sure that we learn from them, yes, but that they also learn from us. Because it's not a question of uh, uh, borrowing the theory 
and practice from Finland and applying it as if it was one size fits all. But it's about reflecting on our practice based on the inputs that they bring to us. It's really a two way collaboration. It's not, in our case, at least, it's not characterized by an imposition of the, 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 the strong or the institution that comes with money. And we are very satisfied with the results so far because the end product is going to be something that was built or constructed by all the partners at an equal level. And this is very important. I hope I have answered the question. That was a brilliant, brilliant answer. And um, I see that uh, there's a whole lot of uh, the other panelists who also want to share something. Um, because we are running uh, slightly, <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. Um, so can I ask everybody just to keep their answers to one or two, two sentences? Um, Pirio, if you, you can go first. I don't kind of see that our relationship with, um, with Nadine and Nadine's colleagues, and I think that Yari Labonen, who is also listening this uh, a podcast is kind of saying the same that I think that our collaboration is collaboration for good science and we have scientific research questions that we solve together and everybody does the one thing that they do the best in that collaboration and that's why you can reach something something that are not possible to reach without this collaboration so I think um, um, African university should not look down to themselves and saying, we know nothing. I think that that's a kind of very old fashioned thinking. Uh, it's a scientific question that we solve together wherever we are. So I would like to emphasize that kind of collaboration rather. Sorry, a bit long. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much, Pirio. Nadine. Uh, I just wanna emphasize what Pirio said. And I think in any partnership, people come with different strengths. And part of clarifying how you fit together is thinking about what your expectations are and putting it on the table. And if I've learned one thing about Finnish people, they're straight talkers. So this is an amazing relationship that we are able to build with them because we're pretty straight talking ourselves. Thanks. Thank you, Nadine. Irmili. Yes, we... We do, we are the, the very straight, but also the way how, how, for example, these planning periods, those are always quite short. So this also, this planning of these uh, research projects, it, it needs this type of collaboration that since beginning, since planning ways, the people are, are very honest, very uh, uh, straightforward, like how, to, how we can both ends a benefit from this period. Uh, the research cycle, for example, is often very short. So once there is a long-term collaboration, it doesn't only uh, exist during the short research period, but the something which you are aiming to do the long-term collaboration. Then I think that you can find that type of collaboration which the both benefits. But if you are just looking the money for the two years or, or four years. Uh, did that type of collaboration doesn't normally uh, raise up. You need to look the longer political uh, efforts and aims to, to collaborate, not only the, the money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irmeli. Uh, Eja. Yes. Uh, already the preparation process of, of any project that kind of brings the partners together and, and, and the success of the project is very much, these are highly competitive projects we are everyone doing. So if this kind of mutual respect and, and needs and benefits for both are not seen in, in, the, in the document, you don't get through. So, so I kind of echo this, that, that we wouldn't be in these partnerships without recognizing that it's win-win situation where we respect each other. But then it's also kind of a practical arrangement that we need to give the lead for the one who is the right person to have the lead. So very often the lead is with the Southern partners and our role is to facilitate the processes or development activities we are doing. And, and 
and and and and not imparting, but being the facilitator, being the one uh, going with the partner and 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 helping to find the right answer. So so not imposing, but but recognizing, respecting, and and working together. Very simple things, but we have to keep them in our minds all the time. Of course, thank you. Um, just as a final thought, because we are running out of time, um, and I'm going to throw this one to all the panelists, uh, quick answers, one or two sentences. What would you say are some of the skills or attitudes that are most important for me to develop if I plan on pursuing a career as a researcher? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> um, Sarita, you can go ahead. That's a different, difficult question, uh, Monsea. But anyway, if I'm looking for the career as a researcher, you know, being prepared to learn at all times, being aware of what's going on, uh, getting to know your reality, the reality in which you, you live in, your society, but not only, do not just close yourself within the globe of your society. Be alert about to what's going on around the world. Build networks, relationships here and there. This would be the advice that I would give to you. Be connected, develop your tentacles. He, not just with the institutions from the north, but also among ourselves in the region, in the continent. What else to say? The colleagues will add. Your network is your net worth. Um, Nadine. I'm going to add just a few comments onto that because I agree completely with that. It's also to have this curious and imaginative mindset combined with a discipline to be able to execute on a project to be able to plan it and systematically work through it so that you get to your end results. I'm gonna give my other colleagues a chance. Thank you. Uh, Prof Pirio, you wanna go? I tried to make a one sentence, but uh, I got four concepts. Hardworking, um, open-minded, future-minded, and collaboration skills. Uh, in a high level. I think that's that's the power. Nice. Um, Armeli. I, I keep it to two things, critical thinking and open-minded. So thank you very much. Short and sweet, uh, Prof Aya. Okay. Uh, this okay. was a very clever question to be put in the end because we are building the right answer together. So that's the collaboration. That's what the research is for. So uh, be a team player, be persistent, be determined, be hardworking, but be a collaborator, be a team worker. Very nice, thank you. And Prince, your final thoughts. Yeah, so add, I think everything has already been said, but I would say that being able to to think independently and also uh, have a good research idea and then apply for funding. By so doing, you will develop your research career. Wonderful, thank you, Prince. Um, we unfortunately have run out of our time for the panel. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that next week we are going to dive into the practicalities, the nitty gritties of how to um, apply for studies, scholarships, research positions, uh, permits, all those kind of things. Um, so please join us. Um, Masia. Uh, yes, you definitely don't want to miss out. Next week's episode is going to be really, really important. Um, you know, we've discussed all the cool things and all the exciting things. Now we need to get to the practical things and uh, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be next week. Invite all your friends. And um, we'll actually show you a bit of a teaser after this uh, as to what you can expect in next week's episode. But first, a quick introduction to Finland's representatives in Namibia and Angola. Uh, that's just before we show you what you can expect next week. Great. Um, I wonder, do we have uh, Namibia? Do we have Henrik and Mati? Are they uh, standing by? Um, well, yeah, there they are. Over to you guys in Namibia. 
Yes, thank you all for joining this uh, webinar. We here at the Embassy of Finland uh, in Windhoek have really enjoyed this event. It has been really inspiring day uh, and with excellent uh, discussions. And also Alberto Samasea, uh, you have done a really great job. So congratulations and, and thank you. Uh, my name is Matti Karvanen. I'm the deputy head of mission here uh, at the Embassy of Finland in Windhoek. And our embassy actually covers both uh, Namibia and Angola. And I'm um, Henrik, I'm the new intern here at the embassy. Uh, uh, I've been here now roughly three weeks. Uh, I ended up here because of my long held fascination for the history of Namibia. And uh, now that I've been here for three weeks, I've been nothing but impressed by this country. It's a great place to be and I love it already. Uh, furthermore, uh, we'd like to, with Matti, introduce the third wheel of our, of our uh, little uh, team here, Hannele, who sadly could not make it here. Uh, she's on her holiday in Finland, but uh, uh, she's really the focal point of the uh, education sector when it comes to the embassy in, here in Windhoek. So uh, we'll be putting her contacts into the chat uh, after our little uh, speak here, I guess. <laughs> Yes, and uh, here in Namibia, we are getting quite optimistic uh, currently after a devastating third wave of uh, COVID-19 hit the country in June and July. Now the COVID cases are going down and Namibia is also winning medals in athletics competitions and uh, also the spring is uh, slowly making its way here in Namibia. So, so a lot of uh, good vibes and, uh, and positive energy here at the moment. And uh, as you might know, uh, Finland and Namibia, our people and our countries, uh, we share a long history of uh, cooperation and particularly in education sector. Yes, uh, our cooperation actually goes back all the way to the Namibia's independence struggle uh, in the 90s and even beyond that. Uh, so Namibia and Finland have a long-standing relationship with each other, a thing we are really proud of and happy about. Uh, these days as well, uh, there's very active cooperation between various Finnish and Namibian higher education institutions, uh, such as, uh, for example, the Turku Plugin University here in Windhoek uh, being a prime example. Uh, but it's not, definitely not the only one, so there's plenty of uh, those uh, around. Uh, also, a lot of student exchange uh, happens between our countries, and uh, that's also a very positive thing we hope to see also in the future. So all Namibians out there, uh, if you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to contact our embassy. We are happy to provide you with uh, information on study opportunities in Finland. And if we cannot answer your questions, we will, of course, direct you to the right sources of information and to the right people. So from us, thank you all for joining this uh, really inspiring webinar. We now let our colleague uh, Mrs. Lotta Carlson to introduce herself. Uh, Lotta is also working for our embassy, but she's physically based in Luanda in Angola, and she's covering our uh, cooperation and our, and our activities in uh, Angola. Thank you. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. Bon dia a todos. My name is Lotta Carlson. I work as a Finnish resident diplomat, minister counselor here in Luanda, Angola. I'm living here since November 2020. I work in the same premises with my Nordic colleagues. My main duties are related to the political relations between Angola and Finland, and especially to creating new business opportunities, trade, commercial relations uh, between our countries, which would be a win-win situation. Our small but active Portuguese-speaking Team Finland Angola team includes myself, our honorary consul here in Luanda, my Business Finland colleague in Helsinki, Finland, and my Knowledge Finland colleague in Pretoria, South Africa. Please don't hesitate to approach us if you have any questions. As you would be interested in how studying in Finland would be like, or how it is at the Finnish universities, 
I would have a hint of a day for you. As there is a free online course in artificial intelligence, which I would, of my own experience, recommend you to take. You can find the course on course.elementsofai.com. Há também uma versão portuguesa daquele curso naquela página. I would wish you the best of luck with your studies, and I really hope that you get interested in what Finland can offer. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to all of the panelists for joining us. Um, it's been incredibly, incredibly, English is a difficult language, incredibly insightful. Um, if you've missed the first episode, you can go and watch it online at futurewithfinland.com. Uh, today's episode will also be uploaded within the next two days or so. So please go ahead, check it out, share it with your friends, families, your colleagues, your sports teams, your clubs, your churches, with everybody. And uh, don't forget to follow all the activity on social media as well. And speaking of social media, join us next week for the final episode of What the Future is Made with Finland because we have some social media prizes where you, that you can win. Um, of course, all the details are up online as well. Albert. Thank you. Thank you, Masia. And uh, once again, just from my side, thank you so much to the panelists. You guys are absolutely great. Um, and thank you so much to everybody um, who participated. Thank you for all the comments and the questions. We love you and we are looking forward to seeing you next uh, Wednesday. Uh, before you go, please have a quick look and see this little taster of what you might expect next Wednesday. Goodbye. <laughs>